Um, pause recording, please. My webinar tonight. Um, can all of you hear me? If you can hear me, can you please type a yes? And also, uh, this webinar is going to be recorded. Uh, so you will receive the recording tomorrow via a YouTube link in your email. Okay, thank you, Janice. So Janice has said, yes, she can hear me. Uh, can the rest of you hear me? If you can, could you please type a yes for me, please? And just make sure that it's going out to everyone so that we can all see your messages. Uh, that's so that when you ask questions as well, uh, it will benefit the entire audience that's here tonight. All right, okay. And also because I can't see you, so, uh, so that I know that you're okay. All right, so let's get started. Uh, this is the quarterly market outlook for July um, and um, hopefully it'll help you out. There's a lot of hot topics at the moment in the market, for example, recession, uh, which is why I've chosen to talk about it today. Um, so let's go ahead. And also Amos is here tonight. So as you know, Amos is on my team. Uh, Amos, can you say hi? Uh, if you're having any technical issues or things like that, uh, Amos can help you out. And later on, he'll also post our contact details. So uh, because most of you are my clients from CMC Markets, uh, therefore, um, you can reach out to us and we'll help you out. Okay, so it won't be a long one tonight. It'll probably be about 45 minutes and then you can grab some rest before the market starts. Okay, so let's get started. Um, Let's get started. Just let me get my bearings. <laughs> okay. All right. So, okay. So just a disclaimer, uh, I have to post this, okay? So um, all information that is said, shared, or shown tonight is for educational purposes only, uh, not an indication to buy or sell. That's very important because um, whatever we've put together for you is based on our research. Uh, and um, if you do choose to trade, um, please note that it's at your discretion, okay? There are some opportunities coming up later as well. Uh, but again, uh, that is based on our research and our analyst as well, uh, what he's done. So. Um, it's just for educational purposes if you choose to trade at your discretion, okay? So now that's uh, done, uh, what we're touching on today, it's three major categories. So um, indicators of recession, uh, traditional and otherwise. So I've noted two categories because I'm sure most of you that have been in the market for quite some time, you'll know that they are quite like traditional indicators. Uh, we'll run through them later. And there are some otherwise because of course, every recession is a little bit different from the last should it happen. And as you know, economic uh, factors are always fluid. Uh, so we kind of have to uh, go with the flow. Um, so as of right now, uh, this is what we're sharing. Um, if the circumstances change, of course, we'll, we'll update you as well. Right. And um, the second one we have are how assets are affected by rate hikes and recession, because we are currently in an environment of rate hikes. Uh, we just completed the fourth one. Right. So that happened. Uh, that was 75 basis points uh, as the probability indicated. And that happened. So um, that will be interesting as well, because some things have happened since then, like how the Fed is going to approach the next two rate hikes, because we're supposed to have six this year. OK. Um, and lastly, uh, where you may find trading opportunities leading up to the recession and if a recession occurs. So something for right now, something for the future. Because um, as we all know this year, the markets haven't been the easiest, uh, easiest environment to trade in, right? So we kind of want to look at where the other opportunities are as well. Okay, so with that, I'll get started. Now, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask at the end of every section. So there are three here. At the end of every section, I'll ask you if you have any questions and then you can let me know. Uh, if let's say I don't answer yours right away, if there are too many questions, um, just ask again. Uh, I will do my best to answer all your questions tonight. All right, okay. So um, are we ready to start? If you are ready to start, can, we, can you type a start, please? Hi. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Perfect. So we are going to start right now. Um, so let's start with the first section. Okay. So recession indicators. Now I'm going to start with the most common one. All right. So um, unfortunately we didn't have time to prepare polls tonight where it's more interactive. So I'm just going to rely on your yes, no's. Okay. So for recession indicators, one of the most common one is the yield curve. Now, how many of you have heard that the yield curve inverting means that there's a recession coming? If you've heard that, can you type a me please? Okay, so that's two me's. Any more? 
if you have heard that an inversion in the yield curve uh, means that there's a recession coming, can you type a me, please? Okay. Okay, I'll leave it at that. I think you guys need to warm up a bit. All right. Okay, so um, there is this saying that when the yield curve inverts, now what does that mean? So usually, um, be it analysts or like uh, economists, they'll look at the US 10-year uh, treasury and the US 2-year, right? Because 2-year is a short-term kind of out. Uh, outlook to how the economy is growing, right? What's the prospects? So for the two year, um, I actually shared this in my last webinar about the yield curve, right? So for the two year, it represents short term uh, economic uh, outlook, okay? So usually the 10 year, which represents long term economic outlook in a healthy economy, the two year should be lower than the 10 year. Right, But why do they say that when the economy is going into recession, there will be an inversion? Because if the long-term economic outlook is not good, in which case the two-year interest rate would be higher. Okay, So the two-year would be higher than the 10-year. Okay, so that's the theory. And so when does that happen? So what you're looking at at the chart right now, Okay, so all the orange bars that you see here, Okay, on the left, it marks the start of recession. Okay, so I'll use this one. So uh, start of recession and end of recession. Okay, that's when the Federal Reserve chooses to announce it. Sometimes the uh, recession has already started, but they haven't announced it yet. Okay, so depending on the timing, but generally that's what those orange bars mean. Now, if you look at the blue line, so the blue line uh, is actually the 10-year interest rate minus the two-year interest rate, okay? So 10 minus two, if the 10 is less than the two, you get negative, right? So if you look at the bottom of the chart where I've highlighted the red rectangles for you, so one inversion right before the recession, right? This one is another inversion right before the recession. And um, just let me move some stuff. Okay, so um, one more here, right? And you'll see one more here. Okay, so during, uh, before COVID happened as well, some people said, so where I'm circling right now, some people said that, oh, okay, the yield curve has inverted, but it was kind of a mild inversion. So before it even fully um, kind of, uh, suffered the impacts of what COVID was doing to the economy, uh, you guys know that the uh, Federal Reserve actually started to hike, uh, cut rates already, right, in an attempt to kind of save the economy, so to speak. So we never really went into a recession, even though there's a very thin orange bar showing you that uh, there was a recession. Um, technically, uh, we didn't actually go into recession then. But if you look now, so there's a much, much clearer, uh, what do you call that? There's a much clearer inversion at the moment, as you can see at my last arrow straight on the far right, okay? So, but they haven't announced recession yet. There are a lot of talks about it, uh, but not yet. But you can see that this particular indicator is uh, fairly accurate, so to speak. So, inversion and then recession, inversion, recession, so, so on and so forth. So, this is one of the signposts, uh, one fact that we can use uh, that may point us towards uh, recession okay but it's not exactly confirmed we're going to look at a few other indicators because um, when you're trying to look at the market you need to look at as many facts as possible okay so I'm just going to clear all those drawings and we will move on okay so Nick, this is one indicator, the yield curve. Uh, the second one we're going to look at, look at is also fairly straightforward. So this is uh, consumer sentiment, right? So it's also known as the Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. Consumer sentiment also means like uh, how people are feeling, right, in general. So uh, consumer sentiment index, if consumer sentiment is down, uh, that probably means that they're not going to be spending as much. So usually, again, the orange bars uh, will show you start and end of recession. So start being on the left and then um, end being on the right. And again, the timing is not always so accurate, okay, the way that they announce it. But in general, so you can see that. Just let me move my bars out of the way. Okay, so let me get my pencil out this time. Okay, so you can see that this is start of recession, end of recession, start and end, and start and end. Okay, 
And if you look at those, you can see that at the start, when they announce a recession, generally the consumer sentiment is going to drop. Okay, but starting from the 2001 uh, period, you can see that usually before the consumer sentiment uh, drops even further, there's already a sort of steep plunge um, before recession is announced. So if you look at the 2001 example, the plunge is steep, right? So it's like almost like a vertical line. And if you look at 2000, about 2009, okay, it's also fairly steep. And then when recession is announced, it goes down even further, right? And this one, of course, was COVID. So this was uh, this last example here. It was quite instant. But as you can see, as of now, we are already consumer sentiment is going down. So it's possible that by the time they announce the recession, uh, it may plunge a bit more if recession happens. So for the MCSI, uh, it's something for you to look at because what we're going by is not what happens during the recession, but what happens before. So you generally see quite a steep curve of, um, let me do this. Okay, a steep plunge. Uh, right now, it's not really plunging at the moment, I wouldn't say, uh, because it's kind of doing an up-down thing. Uh, but if you do see like a steeper plunge, a continuous plunge, then it may be an indication that recession is happening or is going to happen very, very shortly. Okay, so... I'm going to clear the drawings of this one as well, and then we will go to the next indicator. All right. So for the next indicator, what we're looking at is the ISM. So for ISM, uh, that stands for Institute Supply Management, um, but ISM represents manufacturing. So if you want, you can also look at the PMI. Uh, look, the charts that I'm using are actually from TradingView, so you can easily access that. So um, what the PMI is, manufacturing in general, um, I'm sure many of you will know that if, um, let's say there is a recession, manufacturing sector, uh, the manufacturing numbers will be the first to show it. Why? Because in general, when there's a recession, people consume less, so the production is also uh, much less. And also the other thing you can look at is whether layoffs are happening. So leading up to recession, usually there are a lot of layoffs, right? And it's already started. Uh, this time, uh, because of the kind of environment we're in, it started with the crypto sector, for example, and then it has now gone on to like Shopify, uh, some tech firms. So when the layoffs start, um, that means that because maybe the demand is shrinking, so they produce less and they need less workers and the company is making less as well and therefore they're laying off people. So you can look at the manufacturing uh, numbers. So as you can see, same thing. So orange bars are start of recession, end of recession. So it is quite obvious here. Pencil. Okay, so you can see when the recession starts, manufacturing goes down, right? And sometimes, because um, they don't always announce it on point, uh, it also starts plunging before the recession starts and may start recovering halfway through or at some point, or there may be a delayed effect, right? But the idea is that when... So you can see that all of this is a very kind of like a middle gauge kind of thing, right? Okay, sorry for, sorry for the not so pretty rectangle, uh, but you can see there's a range that this goes up and down in. Now, if it exceeds the range, uh, when you see something like that, like very far off, uh, almost like a swing low, um, then in which case it could also be an indication of uh, an upcoming recession. So manufacturing is a good thing to look at. Uh, now, do I think that we are on the verge of recession uh, based on certain facts that we have seen so far, uh, just a few in fact, and uh, what you read as well, um, such that there are layoffs happening. And uh, one more thing uh, that one of my colleagues actually alerted me to is that when an economy is healthy, uh, and growing. Generally, you tend to see a lot of mergers and acquisitions happening. So companies taking over other companies to, let's say, expand, right? Um, so an example, uh, now don't take this as like a, a hard fact, okay? It, it is an interpretation. I thought it made sense uh, when it was shared with me. Uh, therefore, I'll share it with you. All right, so um, mergers and acquisitions do happen when the economy is going fairly well. Um, so the fact that uh, Elon Musk wanted to buy Twitter at that time, um, it was an indication that, oh, okay, maybe it's not as bad as we think uh, the situation because back then there was already word of recession spreading around, right? 
But now that he's backed out of the deal uh, for reasons that he stated publicly, but uh, may not be the true reason, uh, now that he's backed out of the deal and you don't see any other mergers and acquisitions happening, it may also be an indication uh, that there's something under the hood, you know. Uh, so this kind of thing, uh, because it's a little bit more abstract, you don't have to take it as fact, but it still can be kind of a signpost or a rough indicator. Okay, just as an addition to like uh, whatever other hard facts that you see, like ISM, uh, which is also PMI and uh, things like the yield curve. All right. Okay. Uh, just to check in at the midway uh, indicator, uh, recession indicators mark. Are you guys okay? And are you all still with me? If you're okay, can you please type in okay? So I know that you guys are still here. Okay. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, soon we'll try to do some uh, physical webinars. So I actually can see you guys. Uh, it's been three years now. So um, we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, thank you for letting me know that you're okay. I will keep uh, going on. Okay. So let's move on to the next indicator. Uh, sorry about the lag. My... I seem to be having an issue with my mouse today, uh, but that's okay. All right, we'll move on. So now, recession indicators, this is the abstract part. So what I've shared with you the past three were more of like hard facts. Um, this one, um, because you know, actually trading and uh, reading the market is a bit of an art, not an entire science. So you do have to add a bit of like macro knowledge and what's going on in the current situation because every situation is different from the last uh, slightly, right? So this is a bit abstract. So I'm going to explain this chart to you. Um, so if you can stay with me. So one of these things is uh, possibly Europe. Now, why have I stated that? Okay, so what this chart shows you is actually generally in a recession, uh, not that recession affects every economy or every country, but generally uh, we'll go by the bigger one. So US and Europe, right? So US and Europe, what this chart essentially shows you is... Okay, so... What this chart shows you is that this is US, okay, and this is EU, right? So the blue bars are US and the orange bars are Europe. So generally, because US is considered one of the largest economies uh, in the world, or rather the largest currently, uh, there are talks of China trying to overtake them, but that's a conversation for another day. So for US, uh, generally when the recession hits US first, Right, And then it hits other countries, like uh, other economies like Europe, and there's a trickle down in fact to Asia and all of that. Right, So generally, it hits US first. So there are some cases where it hits uh, one economy, but not the rest. So um, there's one for US, this would more be uh, the dot-com era. And there's one over here as well in uh, 2009, right? And the one in 2000, but just the orange bar, right? So this one that says EU right here, just the orange bar, uh, that was the sovereign debt, uh, which involved Greece. So there are occasions, again, where it doesn't hit all economies, but generally speaking, uh, what this chart is trying to show you is that usually when there's a recession, it hits the US first. But this in this current climate, that may be a little bit different uh, because you all know what happening is in, in Europe right now, right? Because there is a Russia and Ukraine war going on. Uh, and of course, because Russia uh, exports a lot of oil uh, and one of its biggest consumers uh, is Europe, uh, as well as for natural gas. So what happens in this situation is that um, the prices of gas and food as well, because Russia does export some commodities like wheat, uh, things that are used to make uh, other foods, when there's a shortage, the prices go up. So when the prices go up, generally there'll be uh, inflation, right? A naturally uh, occurring inflation for both energy as well as uh, food costs, which is happening in Europe right now. So you see it on the news quite frequently. And um, not that it is a preceding thing. Inflation is not generally a preceding thing of a recession, but generally what happens is when the prices get so high, uh, there may be a point where people uh, stop buying or reduce their buying, okay? So what happens is if uh, there is a likeliness that the recession may hit Europe first this time, okay? So just let me show you a chart of... Okay, so there are a lot of charts today because uh, a lot of facts, right? So much more charts than there uh, are of words, which I think it's better, it's easier as well to visualize. So 
um, just let me show you this chart. So if you can see who imports uh, Russian barrels and how many, uh, most of these countries are actually European countries, right? The only ones that are not, uh, you can see on the chart, which would be Turkey, where my mouse is right now, uh, as well as, let me see, United Kingdom right? Because they're no longer part of Europe. So other than that, the rest of the countries actually belong to uh, the European Union. And Germany, of course, is uh, kind of one of the biggest uh, economies in the European Union. So therefore, Europe is most affected uh, by what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. So if there's a recession, it's likely uh, that it may hit them first. Okay, so you may take it as a possible indicator. If let's say Europe announces a recession, then there might be a possibility that that will trickle to the US as well. Um, of course, this is just an add-on because um, the, the other indicators that we've looked at have already kind of pointed to uh, the US heading for a recession. Um, whatever the Federal Reserve may say. So um, the Federal Reserve, uh, as you know, last night um, during the rate hike, they did mention that they are going to be slowing down uh, on the rate hikes and that we are not headed for a recession. Uh, but then again, because this entire economy situation is always um, fluid, so you... Um, what they say may change, okay? So it's the same way how they said inflation was transitory, uh, but we are still here, right? Okay, so... Another one that I would like to share that I think it's not commonly heard. So I um, basically, I learned this from somebody in JP Morgan, a very esteemed uh, research person, head of research. He mentioned the dollar smile in one of the conferences that we recently attended. Uh, and I thought this was particularly interesting and it made sense as well. Uh, so I hope that um, this will be something new that you learned today. Okay, so what is the dollar smile? So basically the dollar smile is this thing over here. So you can see it looks like a smiley face, right? So um, what does it mean? So there are two sides, right? At the top two uh, edges of the smile, right? The US dollar appreciates. Now I'm mentioning this uh, as a background because later on we're going to talk uh, about where the opportunities are and this relates to that, okay? So just let me pull up uh, my pen again. Okay, so, all right, so now let's start with the left side, okay, so we'll go left to right. So currently, I would say uh, we are somewhere here, okay, because when there are interest rate hikes, oops, okay, so when there are interest rate hikes, it makes the value of the dollar go up because it looks more attractive, let's say, to investments or for people who want to buy the dollar, it's a higher interest, right? So as you hike rates, as you increase the interest rates, generally, the uh, strength of the currency would actually go up. So on the left side, what you're seeing is if, if let's say the US outperforms the rest of the world, or in this case, it's hiking rates, then you should see a dollar appreciation. So the value of the dollar goes up, currency gets stronger. Now, what they also said was that if let's say we are heading towards a recession, uh, Leading up to it, generally, there'll be a depreciation in the dollar. But in the recession itself, when the uh, globally we are slowing down or in the US as well, you want a safe haven asset, right? So safe haven assets are things that uh, can do well, okay? Or maybe a bit uh, where you want to put your money in uh, because it doesn't depreciate when the economy is depreciating, right? So uh, stocks are not like that. Stocks are considered risky assets and stocks are fairly cyclical. Uh, we'll just emit the sectors for now first, okay? So um, stocks in general are risky assets. So people generally don't buy them or trade them uh, when there's a recession going on, okay? Theoretically, uh, of course you can, but uh, I'll talk about that later, okay? So in recession, generally what you want to be doing is putting in your money into where it's safe, Okay, or also where there's a higher interest, such as treasuries, like government-backed bonds, for example, or 
currency. So people do uh, put their money in, let's say, USD or strong currency when there's recession because there's also a saying that cash is king, right? During recession, if there's nowhere to put your money, you just want to accumulate a lot of cash, right? So when that happens, uh, when USD is treated as a safe haven asset during recession, then generally what you would see is the USD appreciating, okay? So we are not currently at that side of the curve, right? But this is what the dollar smile concept is. Uh, and I found it particularly interesting because if you can use this as a gauge as to whether we're going to recession or where the economy is moving, then that also represents opportunities for you to trade when the rest of the assets seem to be going a little bit slow on a downward trend or a little bit sluggish because this is actually like uh, something you can track. It's a chart that you can see. So um, how do you track the dollar? You can look at the dollar index. I'm going to show you the chart in a minute. It's called the DXY. Okay, so um, this is generally the curve of what the dollar smile is. Uh, do you have any questions about this so far? Uh, because this is a new concept. So if you have any questions, uh, ask me now and then I will move on to the next slide. Uh, but of course, if you haven't, if you don't have a question yet, you can ask me at the end of the webinar. That's fine as well. Okay, uh, just so I can gauge how many of you have actually heard of the dollar smile. If you have, can you type a me, please? If you haven't, type a no, and then I will have a rough gauge. No, ah, okay. Okay, so, so far, no me's. All right, so this is a very real thing. I didn't make it up, okay? So you can uh, Google it, dollar smile. I, I personally found it very interesting uh, because uh, I... When I was doing my research, uh, this is something new that actually came up. Okay, so and after that, after finding out about the dollar smile, I actually did some other research to see how it can impact uh, other parts of other assets and other concepts and it worked, which I'm going to share with you today. Okay, so this is the dollar smile. Uh, you can do more research about it later or if you decide that you have some questions after the webinar, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we will answer your questions. Uh, and if I'm not entirely sure, I will find it out for you. Okay, so this is the dollar smile. And this is the DXY. So based on the dollar smile concept, uh, what asset are you looking at? Actually, it's called DXY. Uh, now, you can find this on the CMC platform. Uh, you can find it in TradingView. So you can actually look at the DXY. Okay. So now, again, the orange bars. Uh, so I've uploaded the same kind of uh, reference point to all of the charts. Okay. Um, so that's easy to see. Orange bar, start of recession on the left and of recession on the right. Okay. So now, when the recession starts, it isn't always true that um, it, it, the dollar will appreciate like immediately, okay? But um, generally, that's how it goes. So you can look at the DXY. It's a very tradable asset. Uh, you can go long and short on it as well. So based on the dollar smile concept, if you think maybe in two months, we're heading into recession and you decide that, oh, maybe I want to try a short. It's something that you can do. And if recession does hit and you decide that you want to long the dollar, in which case you can do that as well, right? With CFDs, you can go both ways. So let's look at this example. Okay. All right, so um, we can start. So for all of the charts I showed you tonight, I've started from 1989 because anything further than that, uh, I don't think we'll really remember. Okay, also I was born in 1989, so I like that year. So, okay, so you can look at the first recession here, right? So you can see, okay, I think in this case, right, the smile is quite valid, lah, all right? But of course, it's not always like that. Uh, but generally, you can see in the midst of the rece uh, recession, about halfway, uh, then the dollar starts to appreciate. And it also depends on when the recession is announced. Over here, um, it started a little bit later. And then on the third example here, it actually started appreciating uh, right away. Okay. And then when it started depreciating again, the recession, uh, they were announcing that the recession was going to end. So um, at the moment, it makes sense, right? The theory makes sense that the dollar goes up during recession and comes down um, just as we're going in or when sometimes a little bit after uh, when recession is announced, okay? So uh, again, we are not going to look at COVID because uh, COVID was a little bit of an outlier, right? Okay, so I'm just going to clear these drawings and I will relate it to currently what we are going through. Just need to move a couple of things around, okay. All right, so right now we are here. 
okay, uh, where the blue dot is. Uh, right now, the dollar is already appreciating, right? But that is because uh, the most, uh, the easiest link to make is because we are going through interest rate hikes at the moment. Uh, and honestly, the US, uh, as you may have read on the news, they're a little bit more aggressive than other countries, right? And we've already been through four rate hikes. Uh, the last one was 75 and the previous one as well. So, um, DXY is over there, so we're going up at the moment, but maybe if we're going to lead into a recession, uh, recession, there may be some weakness in the dollar. Okay, so I'm going to touch on that a little bit more later on, right? Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, also, just a fun fact, um, there is an expected dollar weakness upcoming, uh, so I will explain that to you and how it uh, relates to what kind of opportunities there are in the market. Okay. Just let me take a sip. All right. So what are the effects of rate hikes and recession? Uh, maybe you can tell me. Uh, so it's a little bit more not so one way, right? So uh, we've already seen four rate hikes now. For the last three, okay, did the market go up or down? Can somebody tell me uh, or just type uh, up or down, uh, whichever you think it is, because today I have no polls, unfortunately. So for the last three rate hikes, so not the current one, yeah, the current one, there was a rally, we already knew that. Um, for the last three rate hikes, did the market go up or down? Any takers? Down, ah, okay. Yep. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Ing Hock. Anybody else want to participate in this? Okay, quiet class. Lah. Okay, okay, I don't force you. Okay, thank you, Yangling. Okay, so down. Yes, generally, the idea is that uh, whether uh, it's before or after the rate hike, like uh, not so much of an immediate effect, but generally rate hikes uh, make borrowing more expensive and things like that. So generally, it sends the stocks downwards. And I think I said in my last webinar as well, uh, it impacts the tech sector more than others, right? So rate hikes are not great for stocks in general, okay? Of course, some stocks do, do well, uh, but end recession as well is not great for risky assets because uh, there is a term in the market, risk on or risk off, right? So when people are risk on, um, they are very keen on putting their, asset, uh, their money into riskier assets like stocks and cryptocurrencies uh, when they are risk off, okay? So like in recession or during rate high environment, then they start taking their money out of stocks and cryptocurrencies because traditionally these assets do not perform well, right? Um, and what's, what does well in rate hike and recession? Generally, currency strength, okay? Because we did mention that uh, when you hike the rates, your currency value goes up right? And treasuries as well, which I also mentioned earlier. So treasuries, uh, what happens during rate hikes is generally the interest rate goes up. So the, what you get for investing in those treasuries or buying those bonds, government-backed bonds, not junk bonds, uh, government-backed bonds, uh, generally the uh, interest rate is higher as well. So these are also considered safer assets. Now, traditionally, uh, gold is considered a safer asset, but uh, at the moment, Actually, for the last couple of months, we haven't been seeing that. Okay, so we'll not talk about gold today. All right. Okay, so on to the next one. Now, uh, this chart is an example. So I know that uh, there's much, there's a lot of theory out there that tells you that, okay, not all sectors perform badly during recession. Um, there are some sectors that perform well during uh, recession or deflation of the economy, we call it. So um, the you guys know that uh, they are cyclicals and defensives. So cyclicals are stocks or sectors that generally do well when the economy is doing well. So they follow the cycle of the economy, like tech, for example, or consumer discretionary. So for consumer discretionary, it's things that you buy when you have a lot of additional income, right? That you can spend disposable income. So like on travel, holidays, things like that, expensive cars, luxury. Uh, so luxury brands as well. So these are considered cyclical sectors sectors and the stocks associated with them are cyclical stocks, right? The other half of the equation is um, defensives. So defensives are supposed to do well uh, when the economy is not doing well. However, in the case of recession, so these defensives, so you guys might already know this, there are, um, let's say, healthcare. So healthcare is supposed to do well anyway because people need uh, health 
healthcare products or let's say like insurance and things like that, they need it anyway. So these sectors are supposed to be not so affected. Uh, also utilities, you're still going to need water, electricity and all of that. So also supposed to be not so affected. Okay. And um, last up, consumer staples. Right, so for consumer staples, uh, they are essentials that you need, right? So for example, you, need, you still need to go to the supermarket, you still have to buy food, rice, potatoes, and all of that stuff. So um, those are also not supposed to be so affected. But why am I showing you this chart is because even if it's not that affected, uh, you may not want to be putting your money into those sectors or those stocks because while they're not affected, they may not necessarily perform well either. Okay, so if um, what may happen if you've already invested in a couple of sectors or a couple of stocks from varying sectors before the recession has started, uh, what that means is that the ones that are in defensives, so like let's say consumer staples or healthcare, they may not be uh, hit as hard, right? So if you look at the orange rectangles, um, just let me get the pen out again. Okay, so let's say over here, right? Uh, most of them are trending down. Uh, you may not be able to see, but there's a yellow line that kind of goes like sideways, right? So the yellow line is actually consumer staples uh, somewhere over here, okay? Whereas the rest of them are going down. Uh, but if you look at the second example, almost everything is going down. It's just a matter of how much, right? Of course, in COVID as well, before... Um, the Federal Reserve started hiking rates, everything went down as well. So um, that's what I mean. I'm showing you this chart because uh, stocks may not be where it's at, okay? When you are coming into a recession or during a recession, if it does happen. Uh, in fact, right now in this environment with all the rate hikes going on, uh, inflation being very high, and lastly with recession looming or fears of it anyway, um, stocks may not be the place to be if you're trying to go long, okay? That means you're trying to uh, profit from price going upwards. What you can do, however, uh, with CFDs is that you can short a stock or a sector. So all of these sectors you can short. If you can just key in the uh, sector ticker like XLY, XLP, it'll come up accordingly. Of course, you can also short an index. So that's one way to look at... Uh, where the opportunities are. Now, if you're not so comfortable with shorting, uh, that's okay. Uh, you can let us know. It generally works the same way as long, just that you profit when the price goes down. That means uh, you sell first, buy back later. Okay, right. So that's uh, generally the effect of rate hikes and recession uh, on riskier assets like stocks. Okay, and cryptocurrency. Uh, that one I don't think needs an explanation because we have seen uh, the price of crypto going down. Um, are there any questions so far? If you have a question, uh, just feel free to ask me. Uh, you can type a Q and then I'll wait for you to ask your question. Okay. Oh, that's a bit far. Uh, any questions? If no questions, I'll move on. Hmm. Okay, so no questions, yeah? All right, so I'll move on um, to opportunities, okay? So where it's at right now, um, the market, again, hasn't been so good, um, but what I have seen that it's an easier thing to look at and to gauge the direction of is Forex, okay? So for Forex, I feel that, um, not that I feel, I, I know, because I look at the markets every day, and um, you can see a very specific trend going on. Dollar index is definitely appreciating. So what you're looking at right now, this is the DXY chart, okay? And the other lines, so the candlesticks are DXY, okay? And the other lines, uh, just give me a pen, okay? Right, so I'll just write this for you. This is the DXY, okay? So that's where the candlesticks are, all right? And these three, okay, these are Forex currencies, right? So currencies that have the USD as a second currency. Now, what does that mean? That means slash USD, okay? So you have uh, Euro USD, that is the blue line, okay? So this is EURUSD. And then the yellow line is pound dollar. So uh, the British pound against the dollar. And then you have Australian dollar represented by the purple line. Okay, so um, before I carry on, 
have you traded Forex before? If you have traded Forex before, type a yes. If you haven't, type a no. So I know how detailed to be, yeah? Oh, a lot of no's, okay. Um, would you be uh, open to trying to trade Forex? If it's a yes, type a yes. If it's a no, type a no. I know Forex generally doesn't have a great reputation uh, because people say it tends to be risky. Uh, yes, it can be risky because uh, I have traded Forex before. I actually started that way. Fun fact. So um, my before I came to CMC Markets, I, I was actually training to be a Forex trader. Not the easiest thing to do, um, especially if you're day trading uh, because it can be very volatile. But generally, Forex, like any other asset, you can actually make a... Uh, kind of uh, medium term trades as well, right? So let's say like a few months instead of a day trading kind of thing, okay? So uh, yes, you guys are open. Very good, okay? <laughs> if not, I was a bit worried because uh, today the opportunities are actually in FX. Uh, for the last few months as I watched the market just... Uh, not being very optimistic, right? Uh, where I saw the opportunity was actually in Forex and a lot of my colleagues as well, like uh, we have an analyst in the office. He also looks at Forex a lot. Uh, for a short time, it was in energy, but at the moment, it seems that Forex is always something to trade, okay? So uh, you can try looking at Forex. Now, if you're not sure, you can ask us, okay? Uh, again, we can't tell you what price to buy or sell at, but we can give you general outlook as to where, uh, what kind of trend it may be, if it's a short-term uptrend or a short-term downtrend. Okay, so uh, back to the chart. So we're looking at DXY at the moment. So you can see that as the DXY appreciates, right, the rest of the currencies with the USD as a secondary currency means it's the currency that's listed at the back, not the front, okay? So like euro first, then USD, pound first, then USD, the Australian dollar first, then USD. So if the USD is at the back, it means that as the USD appreciates, the other currency is weaker. Okay, so if the USD is stronger than the base currency, which is the currency in front, then the pair will go down. Okay, so far is that okay? If that's all right, can you type an okay, please? If not, I will explain again. Or oh, why also can lah? <laughs> okay, ah, okay. So why you're okay? Just to let me know uh, that you guys are, uh, you guys understand what I've just said. Yes. Hello, are y'all still here? Yes, ah, okay, okay, can, can, that's good. Okay, so uh, I'll just repeat one more time uh, in case anybody missed it. So if the DXY, that means the dollar, US dollar is very strong, right? In any currency pair, okay, like we're just going to use the major currency pairs, okay? So like Euro dollar, pound dollar, Australian dollar, where the USD is at the back, and the USD is stronger than the front currency, in which case the pair goes down. Okay, so it's quite obvious to see here, right? It's a inverse correlation. Okay, so what this shows you is that there are two opportunities you can take. So when the rate hikes are going on, um, it's a little bit, uh, now it's a little bit hard to say because we've already gone through four. But if let's say you notice that um, people are saying or the news is saying uh, that the Federal Reserve is likely to be more aggressive with their rate hikes, um, there's a chance that the dollar may continue to appreciate. Now, don't just base it on news. So you guys know that I always share the FOMC countdown uh, where there's a probability, right? How much the probability is going to be by what uh, percentage they're going to hike the rates by or how many basis points. Now, so that's a very good gauge because um, usually that probability is almost tried and true, yeah? Like how... Um, it tends to happen, okay? So you can look at the probability of that. Um, so if the DXY is appreciating, you can uh, choose to take a long trade on the DXY, for example. Alternatively, if you know that the DXY is appreciating, your other option is to look at uh, currency pairs that have the USD as a uh, secondary currency because they tend to go down, right? But... Uh, before you, uh, but this current opinion, right, uh, is it, you have to make a slight tweak to it because um, I'm going to share an opportunity shortly. Uh, that opportunity is uh, dependent on the fact that um, there is an expected 
weakness in the DXY, but I'll explain that shortly, okay? But generally, this is the current concept and theory. So uh, Forex is not a bad place uh, to look at because dollar index is quite clear to me, the trend, rather than the stock uh, market that tends to go up and down, up and down, and it's not, and it's mostly based on sentiment. Whereas, uh, from what I've seen in the markets for the dollar and forex, it's not so much based on sentiment. It's more based on facts. Like uh, there are things that you can back them up with. Okay, so we are going to look at the rationale. Okay, so uh, this is as I explained earlier, anything that has a slash USD, uh, but you may want to try, uh, if let's say it's your first time trading Forex, you can stick to the major pairs. Major pairs means um, the more, the better known currencies like Australia dollar, Euro, and the pound dollar, because uh, there are some currencies that are a lot uh, lesser known. Uh, so those may not be as fluid as well. Uh, there may not be as much liquidity, uh, but these pairs, you can see the price moving pretty clearly because there's lots of trades going on uh, in these pairs. Okay, so as the USD strengthens, the base currency is weaker, therefore the pair goes downwards. And uh, also I've already mentioned that as the US rate hikes continue, chances are that these pairs may continue downwards. So that's one way of looking at it. The second way of looking at it is, okay, for the DXY specifically, okay, now this is not a long-term thing. Uh, remember that in FX, generally people don't hold FX trades for like a year or like six months, nine months, because again, fluid situation changes quite quickly. So usually for FX, you hear a lot of day trading or short term, like uh, one to three days, three to five days, sometimes one to three months. Okay, so specifically for the DXY, the current sentiment is that the Fed has, uh, the Federal Reserve has reached peak hawkishness. Now, what does that mean? Hawkish means they are very keen on hiking the interest rates, right? Uh, and by a slightly larger amount, okay, of course, larger subjective, but uh, the first one we had was 25, and then we had 50, 50, 75, right? 50, yep, yeah, okay. And then the next one uh, that we may have as well, uh, word on the street is that it'll be 50 and 50 again for the next two, okay? Because also last night, uh, if you have read about the rate hike, uh, basically they're saying that, okay, maybe they're going to slow down a little bit, but you do still need to watch like inflation data. And if you follow my Telegram channel, uh, I'll post weekly updates as well on that, like what the numbers are, uh, where we're at, because right now inflation is still high. So, um, whether or not they change their tone on being less hawkish, uh, we have to see, right, as, the, as time goes along. So although the next two rate hikes have been said to be of 50 basis point each, uh, what you can infer from that is that from 75 to 50, it's a less intense rate hike, right? So if they are less intense and the Fed is less hawkish, uh, there may actually be a weakness in the dollar, even though we are still hiking rates, but they are less intensive hikes, okay? But if let's say at any point of time, uh, you see that the Fed is going to be more aggressive, they're going to maintain 75, or they may increase to 100, which is 1%, uh, that would definitely shake up markets. And uh, if they hike rates by 100 basis points, uh, chances are, it's high, that there, there, there's a high chance that the dollar index will go up, okay? But at the moment, what we're saying here is that uh, there is an expected weakness. So if there's an expected weakness, uh, in which case, uh, we're just looking at the DXY4 now. So this one is actually from our company analyst, all right? So uh, some credibility there, yeah? So this is the DXY chart, okay? And basically, uh, you can see over here, so I'm just going to get my pencil out. Okay, again, this is for educational purposes, right? Not an indication to buy or sell, uh, just sharing some levels. So... Uh, our company analyst, his name is Kelvin. Uh, some of you may have attended his webinars before. Uh, so he has shared this, with, he has very kindly shared this with us tonight. Now you can see that we have hit, hit a peak, right? So generally when in trading, when you surpass a swing high, so what are swing highs? Swing highs are things like this, okay? Looks like a mountain peak. What happens is there's generally a pullback, right? 
So we've just hit a peak and he's also highlighted this particular number over here. So uh, that's meant to be a resistance point. That means um, the price movement can't break through that point at this point in time. And therefore, what it's likely to do is to do kind of a reversal, like a temporary pullback. Okay. So now, and also you can see um, that we have, let me clear this and... Okay, so also you can see that we've done a very steep upward move, right? And the previous point of reference would be this one. Okay, so generally what happens a very after a very steep move is that there may be some consolidation, meaning a sideway movement. Uh, this one eventually went downwards after it hit another peak, or it would just hit straight down. Okay, so based on this and he's done uh, some technical analysis as you can see he's drawn like a channel with the light green dotted line okay so we are almost at the peak of the channel right so and he's done some pivot points as well so uh, basically what he's interpreting is that now that we've hit the peak and we face some resistance over here um, there and in the case that there is dollar weakness which is expected uh, what happens is if the price goes downward it may find a floor here and another one here. So floor, you guys know it's support, lah, right? Uh, sorry, I've covered up the prices now. Okay, so floor here, okay? And maybe another one here. Now, generally, um, when you are trading, okay, you do look at uh, support and resistance as, let's say, target areas, meaning where you take profit, or uh, you can use resistance if you're going short, okay, so resistance is a ceiling, and then um, support is a floor, right? So if you're going short from top to bottom, generally resistance uh, can be seen as your stop loss, and um, the floors can be seen as your take profits, okay? So this is how we generally look at levels. Uh, so this is an opportunity that he said uh, would have been about one to three months time frame. Okay, again, this is not an indication to trade. Uh, it's just something that we're sharing tonight of an example that you can look at when you are looking for opportunities. Okay, so uh, just let me have a look. One second. Okay, let's see. Okay, also one more point that you can actually look on the chart is... Uh, let me get my pen again. Okay. Also, you can see this fact that he's uh, put on here for you. So, okay, so this one, okay. So, it is also extremely overbought at the moment uh, if you follow RSI. So, RSI is an indicator that shows you whether or not this asset is overbought or oversold. So, you can see from here when it was overbought, okay, so over here then it tends to uh, go down a little bit. This one was not by much because technically that's considered consolidation. Um, also, if it's overbought, this one was not extremely, but it was considered overbought. And then you can see over here as well, it goes down, right? So um, this is another supporting factor that this asset is currently overbought, which actually supports um, his uh, analysis. Okay, uh, do we have any questions so far on this uh, particular FX chart? Okay, while I wait for you to ask questions, um, I'll just share that for FX, um, if you are using the CMC platform, uh, it's a little bit different because for stocks and commodities and things like that, when you buy one unit, when you key in one, uh, one is one contract or one unit or one stock, right? But for FX, uh, how it goes is that if you key one, and you press enter, it's going to show you the minimum currency uh, that you have to buy, okay? So let's say if you key one and it shows you 400. So let's say the pair is uh, GBP USD. Actually, GBP, the minimum is 800. Oh, no, 400, 400. So 400, so that means you are buying 400 of this particular currency. And of course, uh, the platform will show you the conversion and all that. Uh, if you want to go by lot size. So if you have used other brokers before, or as tonight, you guys have said that you generally don't uh, trade Forex. 
other brokers go by lot size, okay? So on the CMC platform, uh, I'll convert the lot size for you. So one lot is 100,000 of that currency, right? But 100,000 is a lot. So uh, you can go by smaller amounts. So like 10,000, 1,000, okay? If you are beginner to Forex, uh, like when I was trading Forex, I started with 0 0.01, okay? So that's 1,000. All right, uh, thank you, Amos. So Amos has uh, put up the conversion for you. Uh, if you happen to use the CMC platform, you're going by the one on the left. So like the amount of currency. Now, if you are using other platforms that go by lot size, uh, then like let's say MT4, uh, we also do offer MT4. MT4 is a platform generally used by Forex traders. So for MT4, uh, you would go by lot size. So that is the conversion. If you're not sure, just give us a call. Uh, but one more time, if um, you're very new, uh, please start with smaller lots, okay? So it's not so shocking. Uh, it, it's a bit of uh, easing yourself into it. So when I started, I started with a 0 0.01 lot. It's a micro lot, so there's 1,000, okay? So you can try. Uh, if you need help, let us know, okay? All right, so we are moving on. Uh... Again, um, not going so well today. One second. Okay, so uh, now we are looking at interest rate hikes across um, different countries or rather different economies. So um, this is leading up to another opportunity. All right. So as you know, most of the world banks have already started to hike rates, right? US being the orange line, okay, uh, they are the most aggressive. Australia has also started and so has uh, the ECB, uh, which is Europe. Right, so these three have started, but as you can see from the last line on the bottom, the blue, dark blue line, uh, that's Japan. So Japan has not started hiking rates, right? Um, but the rest of the world is, okay? So uh, why, uh, why am I showing you this? It's because it's going to lead up to the next opportunity. So um, the theory is that Japan can't stay uh, that low forever. Uh, they may have to start hiking interest rates. So you can look at this. Uh, CMC doesn't show you the interest rates, but you can use TradingView. Uh, I use TradingView as well for some charts because um, the interest rates generally untradeable. Okay, they are not tradable, so therefore CMC doesn't have it. Okay, but uh, you can type Japan interest rate and it's going to show you, or if you are very up to date with the news, if Japan starts, the Bank of Japan starts to hike interest rates, uh, it will appear in the news. So I'm showing you this because uh, a lot of us in the office have this uh, sentiment, okay, as to where this might lead to. So specifically for USD JPY. Now there are some forex pairs where USD is the base currency. That means the secondary currency is something else, right? So just now when I shared with you like pound dollar, euro dollar, all that USD was the secondary currency. In this case, uh, for uh, dollar yen, we call it. So dollar yen for uh okay i have a question one second okay so assume usd will weaken let's say australian dollar uh weak usd do you do a buy trade uh yes theoretically it can be interpreted that way uh of course there are other things to look at as well um but generally the AUD uh, tends to follow the USD uh, at some point, okay, in terms of strength. So uh, you may want to try a little bit of separated currency, like for example, pound dollar. Okay, so you can look at pound dollar. Um, but if USD weakens, uh, theoretically, yes, uh, based on the inverse correlation, um, the pairs that have USD as a secondary currency uh, would tend to go up. Okay, now uh, don't worry because uh, now we're looking at uh, Forex and all that. Uh, when the analyst does release like a chart or anything like that, I'll share it with you on my Telegram channel uh, because he is watching FX very closely at the moment. So it'll look very similar to the DXY chart that I showed you earlier where he will mark out levels of resistance and support uh, and where the general short-term or, or long-term trend is going. So I will share that with you on my Telegram channel uh, as and when it comes up. Okay, so... Uh, for USD JPY, st uh, JPY still forex. Okay, so if 
the Bank of Japan starts hiking interest rates uh, because Japan generally in Forex, like the JPY is quite a pair of, uh, it's quite a currency of interest. So if BOJ starts hiking interest rate, technically, right, uh, JPY should strengthen against the dollar, in which case uh, that may represent a short opportunity for USD JPY. Okay, so I'll show you uh, on the actual chart now. Uh, okay. Now, this particular chart doesn't have any levels because uh, we are kind of uh, highlighting to you a potential future opportunity. Okay, so it hasn't happened yet. So we haven't drawn any levels or anything like that. Uh, but again, when the analyst comes up with something, uh, if let's say um, the opportunity is hot, uh, we will share with you some charts and some analysis and you can make your own decision from there. Okay, so if you look at the dollar yen, okay, you can see that it's appreciated because for pairs that have the dollar in front, if the dollar is strong, it goes up. If the other currency is stronger or the dollar is weak, then it will go down, right? So in the case uh, that the Bank of Japan starts hiking interest rates uh, and coupled with the fact that there is a potential um, USD weakness that's coming up, then you could expect uh, this pair to kind of hit downwards, right? In which case, it may represent a potential short. Now, also, if you look at the chart, so I'm just going to get my pen out again. Okay, so if you look at the potential chart, we've already experienced a steep kind of movement upwards, right? Okay, maybe I'll draw it alongside so you can actually see the candles. Okay, so steep movement upwards, it's kind of hit like a ceiling. Uh, uh, so what you can expect after that generally is a pullback. So now these are three points that have, uh, have not happened yet. The pullback hasn't happened. One, uh, the interest rate hikes in Japan uh, by the Bank of Japan hasn't happened. Two, and the last one, uh, of course, dependent on whether or not the US dollar weakens, uh, although it's expected, uh, we have to see. So these three factors, if you do see them happening, then there may be a potential short uh, in the dollar yet. Okay, so uh, those are the kind of two examples. We're just easing into it at the moment because I've never talked about Forex uh, live in any of my market outlooks, um, even though I've traded them before. So uh, we're just going to ease you into like just two examples for today, right? Okay, and uh, don't worry, we'll share them um, as and when they come along by the analyst, okay? So um, actually, I think that's the end of my webinar, uh, short one today. So um, do you have any questions? If you have any questions, please ask me now. Uh, if you're a little bit shy, not to worry, you can always drop me a question uh, via email, phone call, or uh, telegram. Uh, Amos, can I trouble you to post our contact details again, please? Okay, we'll just give Amos a moment. And then if you have any questions in the meantime, please do ask me. Um, so today's webinar, I was a little bit nervous about it actually because um, there's a lot of things that I've never talked about before. Uh, but rest assured, we, do, we did do our research. So... Um, and we have shared them with you accordingly. Uh, you can make your own interpretation and you can ask us if we have any questions. So uh, we have a question from Angie. Okay, so... Uh, can I explain the effect of negative GBP, GDP numbers which just came out? Uh, okay, let me verify that and get back to you. But generally, theoretically, if GDP is falling, because uh, GDP kind of represents the growth of an economy, right? So if GDP is falling, in which case that could represent that the economy is not doing so well, uh, right? So the outlook may not be so good. If it keeps falling, that means, because uh, whenever they report the GDP, if you notice that there's a trend going downwards, GDP keeps falling, that's not good. That means the economy is not growing. In fact, it's deflating. So it may actually be another um, an indicator that recession is coming. So GDP is also often looked at because uh, gross domestic product, right? So how much the company, uh, sorry, company, how much the country is generating in general. So um, that is actually also looked at as one of uh, the indicators of uh, in recession. Okay. Um, Hey, give me a second. Uh. There are many private messages. Okay. All right. One second. Okay. So, and it depends on what GDP you're referring to. Uh, if it is a, like a mass kind of GDP, right? Wait, sorry. This is moving too fast and my mouse is not working. Okay. Here we go. All right. 
So if there are like two consecutive declines of GDP, right? Uh, you can interpret it as um, a definition of recession. Uh, generally, uh, what uh, the benchmark is, is a few consecutive months. But I feel like, uh, not I feel like, um, generally it should be like, if let's say it's two or three months, for example, a consecutive decline, economy is shrinking. Okay, so GDP is a fact, right? If the, uh, the economy is producing less, uh, making less money, in which case the economy is shrinking, if there's two or three consecutive times, not a good sign. Okay, so uh, that you can use that as an indicator as well. Uh, for Janice's question, okay, so if you try to ask questions, you can ask them uh, to the group chat so everybody can see your questions. If you're shy, uh, you can also direct message me. Um, so Janice's question is that, what is the reason for bad news, but market went up? Some people kept saying that recession won't happen. Uh, okay, what bad news? Uh, did you mean last night? Because last night was when the interest rate hike happened, right? Uh, is that the bad news that you're referring to, Janice? Can you clarify for me? Uh, because I need to know which uh, juncture you are referring to to be a little bit uh, more accurate. Okay? Okay, my mouse is not doing me any favors today. Okay. Okay, one second. Uh. Yes, last night. Okay, so actually last night, right, there wasn't any bad news. Uh, the rate hike happened as per usual. Uh, so people already, there was a very high probability of 75 basis points. Uh, that means 0.75%, right? So uh, when that happened as per usual, the market went up anyway. Uh, that could be likely due to, because you know they have the press conference as well when they announced the interest rate hike. So in the interest rate hike, uh, the Fed, Federal Reserve Chairman, uh, which is Jerome Powell, um, when he gave the speech, it was also something that uh, I think market participants wanted to hear. So he did kind of say that we are not heading into recession. Uh, that's why he says currently. Uh, and also that um, they may, the, the vibe that he gave off was that they're going to be less aggressive with the rate hikes. So um, because right now, honestly, the stock market has been... Uh, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, uh, the stock market has been moving up and down according to market sentiment, means how people feel, how the market participants feel. So um, if they feel that there is some consolation uh, by what he said, in which case generally the market will still go up, right? So uh, that's what I think happened last night. Uh, there wasn't necessarily any bad news. Uh, it's not uh, always given that when there is a rate hike, the market will go down. It's not always like that. It also depends on the intensity of the rate hike like is it 25 50 75 now that we've been through four rate hikes uh, generally unless it's a very um, large increase for example like 100 basis points uh, the market kind of already expects it so uh, the reaction uh, wouldn't be so severe okay I hope that answer is, answers your question Janice okay and um, next question Okay, let me see. Yeah, sorry, uh, long question. Okay, so Donald has shared a nice piece of information, which is the NYSE. Um, we've signed an agreement with SG, SGX to collaborate on dual listing of companies. Now, Donald's question, oops, uh, once again. Okay, so Donald's question is, Will there be opportunity for SGX to appreciate uh, SGX as a stock? Okay, that one, let me check and get back to you. Okay, uh, I don't usually look at the Singapore market, uh, but Donald, uh, okay, Amos, can you take down uh, the name? Donald, uh, we'll have you, uh, Donald, we have you in our list. We'll look for you and then uh, we'll let you know. Okay, um, whether or not it has an opportunity to appreciate, that is a little bit speculative, uh, but let me check if uh, we have any facts to base it on and uh, we can give you an analysis on that. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so uh, I've also received some news that uh, while I was giving you uh, the webinar and you were with me, that the GDP result came out. So if you're interested, uh, 
the GDP actually contracted by 0.9% this quarter and last quarter it fell by 1.6%. So that's two consecutive quarters now. Now, so um, of course, uh, that kind of backs up whatever we've gone through today. Uh, it, it is in line with the rest of the indicators that there may be a recession coming. Uh, now, if that happens for third, third quarter, uh, I would think it's, we're not very far from recession in the US at least, okay? Whether or not it affects uh, Singapore and the rest of the Asian countries, usually it's a trickle-down effect. Uh, Singapore economy is generally quite strong. Uh, so, of course, uh, we have to wait and see. Uh, but just based on the US, um, it's not looking so good at the moment, okay? But we will give you any updates as they come along. Okay, and any more questions? Okay, so Angie has asked an interesting question. Uh, does that mean Powell was lying last night when he said US is not in recession? Uh, okay, so I'm not going to go against uh, the federal chairman, okay, the Federal Reserve chairman, uh, because he is Jerome Powell. Uh, I don't necessarily think that he was lying. Um, it's just that, again, uh, the economic situation is always fluid. Okay, so sometimes it's not that what we say right now is not accurate. It's just that what uh, whatever happens, whoever says whatever is based on the current facts, right? Or what, however they interpret the situation. So right now it uh, may seem to the Federal Reserve that uh, we are not in recession at the moment. Uh, whether recession is coming or not, nobody knows uh, because at that time when inflation started rising to a very high rate, um, they also said that it was only temporary, right? It's only transitory. But then when uh, inflation started uh, staying uh, for quite a few months now, uh, then they changed their story, right? But again, that's based on current facts. So not that he's lying. It's just that maybe based on the facts. Now, currently, we are not in recession. It is true. We are not in recession right now, okay? So whether it's coming or not, uh, again, uh, we have to wait for the Federal Reserve to announce, lah, okay? But also, you can see from the charts that I showed you that generally, the timing of which that they announce may not also be exactly when the recession happens. It can happen before, uh, slightly before, or slightly after. But what you can rely on are facts. So you can look at what I've shared with you today. Uh, again, there will be a recording so uh, you can go through or if you just want to want us to let you know or clarify anything with us, uh, just drop us an email, call or text, okay? Any more questions for today? Uh, also, just uh, like nobody has a crystal ball, lah, right? So we all don't know for a fact whether it's going to happen. Uh, all we can, we can rely on is uh, what's happening in the market, what has happened, and uh, we can go from there. Okay? Any questions? Any more questions for tonight? If not, I will let you go. All right. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I hope you learned something new and I hope it was helpful to you. Um, for FX, again, uh, I apologize if my explanation was not like uh, completely whole. Uh, I will do my best to improve. It is the first time I'm talking about FX. Uh, I think when I trade it myself and when I talk about it, it's slightly different. So um, I will improve. If you have any feedback, please feel free to let me know. Uh, it would be uh, very helpful to me. Okay. All right, so thank you so much for joining me tonight. We will send you the recording tomorrow. Uh, and please do join the Telegram channel. You will receive weekly updates. And of course, uh, as I have uh, said earlier, um, when the analyst of CMC, okay, very credible person, uh, very skilled at uh, technical analysis as well, when he releases any charts, I will post them to you uh, with his permission. Okay, all right. Thank you so much and have a great night. I will end the meeting now. Uh, please trade safe and feel free to reach out to us if uh, you need any help at all. Uh, we are on till 10.30 p.m. tonight. Okay, stay safe.